All right, let's uh, switch gears and go to our Sunday School lesson. Today I'm going to take another break from our study of Matthew. I promise to pick it up again next time. But these thoughts were in my mind yesterday and again this morning when I woke up, so I decided to put a few things down on paper and uh, hopefully it'll be helpful to you as well. And I call this lesson, Little Things Mean a Lot. Little Things Mean a Lot. An alternative title was going to be, Let's Pick on the Charismatics. But this will apply to more people than just Charismatics. So, Little Things Mean a Lot. I want you to begin by turning to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And I'm going to start reading there at verse 14. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 14. Luke 4, beginning at verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. There went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me, to preach the gospel of, to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Period. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day... Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? I want you to compare what Jesus read, keep your finger there, and go back to the book of Isaiah itself, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. And verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Do you notice Christ separates his first coming, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, from his second coming, the day of vengeance of our God, by a mere comma in Isaiah 61, verse 2. He knew exactly where to stop reading when he was in the synagogue. Where the book of Isaiah has only a comma, a comma separating over 2,000 years of history and time. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Sometimes, rightly dividing the word of truth and separating things correctly will require separation as precise as a surgeon's scalpel to do it right. And in this case, he separated his first advent from his second advent by a mere punctuation mark. Little things mean a lot. Things don't get much smaller than a comma. Another little thing is the word with, W-I-T-H. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts 
Acts 2 and verse 4. Acts 2, verse 4. Here are the day of Pentecost. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Look at chapter 10, Acts chapter 10. Verses 44 and 45. Acts 10, verses 44 and 45. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, and so forth. Go forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with, un with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And also verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? <clears throat> no one in the New Testament ever spoke in tongues. But they spoke with tongues. There's a big difference between those two connectives. If you speak with tongues, then you are in control of it. You're using it as a tool to convey the blessings of God or to convey the gospel. But if you're speaking in tongues, then something else is controlling you. See the distinction? See the difference between those two phrases? And yet it's always referred to as someone spoke in tongues. They're speaking in tongues. He's speaking in tongues. Now there may be something controlling somebody, but it might not be the Holy Spirit. And that's why in the New Testament, in the King James Bible, nobody spoke in tongues. They spoke with tongues. Um, notice, if you're still in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Uh, verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding, but my understanding is fruitful. Did I miss it? My spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Excuse me. Uh, verse 19. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding than by my voice, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. And also verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now here, he says, speaking in an unknown tongue. But he's describing the gift. He's not describing the person who's exercising it. There is no such gift as the gift of unknown tongues. It's a description of the gift. It's not the name of the gift. It's a description of it. Um, For, for the most part, uh, the Korean language, Hakuko, to me is an unknown tongue because I don't know it. That's all the word unknown means. You don't know it. It doesn't mean it's unknowable or it couldn't be learned, but at the moment, the one hearing it doesn't know it. And so to him, it's unknown. The problem the Pentecostals made is they didn't know how to read. 
And in this case, this is, this is something small. It's little because it's a little detail that shouldn't be overlooked. When the King James Bible translators saw that something needed to be put into the text to smooth out the meaning, they would add a word, but they would put the word, print the word in italics so the reader would know that they had supplied that word. And so they put the word unknown in italics every time it occurs in 1 Corinthians 14. And the point is, if someone hearing it doesn't know it, then to them it's an unknown tongue. It's not something that can't be learned or it's unknowable, but at the moment the person hearing it doesn't know it, and so it's unknown. And uh, let's go back, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, in fact, let's, let's do run back there again, Acts chapter 2, because I have another point to make out of this chapter. Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, of course, verse 4 said, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse uh, 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Verse uh, 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Verse uh, 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. The word tongue as it's used in the book of Acts, chapter 2, means a language, a foreign language. We sometimes say uh, his native tongue, or his mother tongue, or a foreign tongue. But in every case, we mean a discernible, intelligent language that can be studied and learned with time. We don't mean some incoherent gibberish that someone utters and babbles into the wind, which means nothing has no syntax, no form uh, about it. So there is no such gift in the New Testament as the gift of unknown tongues. What they, what they mean is unknowable, nobody can know it. You know, It's my private prayer language. That's not in the New Testament either. What we're talking about is a language that the person hearing is not familiar with, and so to them it's unknown because they don't know it. It's in the simple definition of the, of the words, an, uh, unknown tongues means an, a, a tongue that you don't know at the moment. But it's not some mysterious otherworldly thing that controls your tongue and your lips and you have no uh, idea of what's coming out of your mouth. Now, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and begin with me at verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The next little thing that ends up meaning a lot, turns out to mean quite a lot, is the little word for, F-O-R. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The little word for can go in two directions. I've illustrated this to you be in the past. If you go to a fast food restaurant, and you're at McDonald's or some other place like that, you pay for the meal before you eat it, right? But if you go to a sit-down, nice sit-down restaurant, you pay for it after you eat it. So it can go two directions. You're either paying for because of you had it in the past, or you're paying or for in anticipation of it in the future. The big mistake the Pentecostals made is not 
understanding that little word can go in more than one direction. And so they read this, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, as, as, it, as meaning in anticipation of getting your sins forgiven if you do this, and you'll be speaking in tongues and so forth. What they should have done, they should have taken that word and gone into the past and said, in light of past remission of sins, this is what your response ought to be. Keep your, well, you don't need to stay here, but go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, and so forth. There, uh, the, response to, the response Israel should have made to God was because of past remission, past forgiveness, was to embrace and receive the Messiah when he finally showed up, but they didn't do it. Peter reminded them of that back in Acts chapter 2. And they said, in, in light of this, men and brethren, what shall we do? They weren't asking, what should we do to be saved? But they were asking, in light of the fact that we murdered the Messiah, as you just said, what should we do now? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins which you've received in the past, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That Their response should have been to embrace the Messiah while they still had a chance to do so in light of his past forgiveness and kindness to their nation. But most Jews did not. And there came a time when he just turned the gospel to the Gentiles, as many as would believe it, and to whosoever will may come. Now, and I said this wasn't limited just to charismatic mistakes. Go forward, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Mormons have made a very similar mistake. And I can say this from personal experience and conversation with Mormon people. Mormons, let me see if I can't make this as clear as I possibly can for those of you here and anyone watching this later when it's posted. <clears throat> Mormons have one major weapon they use to try and convince the world that they are right and other churches are wrong. Their number one weapon is the fact that they have clean haircuts and they're neat and nice they're friendly and polite, and they truly are. And their kids are well-behaved. They're not in jail. They're not in gangs. They're not piercing and tattooing themselves up. And they're not, they don't have long arrest records. Their number one weapon is their appearance. They wear a nice white shirt. And uh, sometimes you can see the outline of the men's underwear under their, under their dress shirt. That's why I wear these V-neck T-shirts, so it sort of approximates the Mormon underwear, and I can play with, play mind games with them. You know, I had a Mormon bishop try to give me a special handshake because he saw that line in my shirt. He must have thought I was one of them, and I didn't I didn't return the handshake, and he couldn't figure out if I was one of him or not. So I had a lot of fun, but but Mormons, their number one weapon is their appearance, the way they're. Women, their daughters look, the way their sons look, and they're nicely dressed, and they're, well poli they're polite, and they're well-behaved. And the men, in fact, the Mormon missionaries have a little handbook. It advises which color neckties to wear, which color suits to wear, conservative colors, dark blue, brown, black, maybe gray, and limit it to that. They try to, met, and they even recommend how to keep your hair trimmed. Don't keep it freshly buzzed like you just came out of the barber. Have a little bit of growth on there, but have a nice, clean, conservative look. This is what they're recommended to appear as as they knock on doors. And so when you as a Christian look just as clean as they do, you look just as neat as they do, you're just as well-behaved as they are, and your kids aren't 
getting in trouble. You're not, and you don't drink, and you don't smoke. You know what you do? You take their number one weapon away from them. Because that kind of weapon doesn't belong to them only. It's easily taken away from them because you can look just as clean and neat as they are. I get sent on a lot of Mormon funerals through my day job at the mortuary because I look more Mormon than the Mormon lady who actually works there. I look more Mormon than the other men I work with. My boss, he likes to assign me to go work a funeral at a Mormon church. I don't enjoy them, but you know, I go and have some fun anyway. <laughs> I try to put the fun back in funeral. <laughs> so when you dress and, and behave and look as neat and clean as they are, you've taken their number one weapon away from them. It might say, you might think, well, that's very simple and simplistic. I know it is, but that's the substance of it. That's the truth of it. Mormons carry the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, and the King James Bible. Those four books called, they call their standard works. These are their scriptures, and they make a big deal of it. They'll have Bible pictures on the walls of their classrooms, and they'll have the names of Bible characters and Old Testament characters, but they'll also have, you know that, that Sunday school artwork, like the... Um, What was the what was the Bible publishing company um, that we used to use? Get these little Sunday school lessons. Hmm? Yeah, David C. Cook Publishing Company. They have these Bible publishing, uh, Bible uh, lessons, Bible stories, and colorful pictures for kids to be entertained by. Mormons print much the same thing with Book of Mormon stories, Book of Mormon characters to keep their get their kids interested in the Book of Mormon fantasy fairy tale. They, they've seen what works among true believers, and they try to mimic that and copy that. So you'll see that sometimes in their little Sunday school classrooms when you go to their churches. But they don't teach their people to memorize Scripture, commit it to memory, and be able to prove their doctrines from their Scripture. You might think, well, I'm afraid to talk to them on my doorstep. Uh, they might know a whole lot more and ask me questions that I can't answer. Trust me, they can't. They won't. You know a lot more than they know. If you're just reading your Bible as a Christian, you just believe your Bible to be the Word of God and you're faithfully reading it every day, become familiar with the stories, come, become familiar with the work of God and the miracles and the blessings of God, you come, become familiar with what God did through the nation of Israel over time, pretty soon you'll know a lot more than you give yourself credit for and it'll come out of your mouth, you'll ask a question that you didn't think was that complex, that complicated, but they won't be able to answer it. And so don't let people on your doorstep intimidate you. And much the same is true with the Jehovah's Witnesses. But the Mormons have made a big mistake here in 1 Corinthians 15. Notice verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? That one verse is the basis of the whole Mormon belief that you get baptized because of, for the sake of your long lost ancestors who died before Joseph Smith ever came along, before the Book of Mormon was ever translated, and uh, didn't have a chance to hear about the whole gospel. So you get baptized uh, by proxy, get baptized for their sake on their behalf. This is why they're big into genealogy. You study your ancestors and your family tree. So then if they weren't LDS, they weren't Mormons way back when, you go to the temple, you get, get baptized in their name, and somewhere in the unseen world, that baptism will be offered to them, and they'll benefit from it. They can believe in the gospel of Joseph Smith and the restored gospel and finally make it to their you know, celestial kingdom. But what's the main theme of 1 Corinthians chapter 15? The resurrection from the dead. Christ's resurrection and our hope of resurrection because we believe in Christ. Because he rose from the dead, number one, we know it, then we know it can happen. And because we're trusting in him, we have every reason to expect that we can rise again when he calls for us. That's the whole theme of 1 Corinthians 15. 
the expectation of rising from the dead. When you get baptized in water, you're picturing one day when God calls for you and you come up out of the grave. You're, you're picturing that uh, ahead of time, sort of a, a foreshadow of coming attractions. You're anticipating the day when you die and come back to life again in glorified power at the rapture or uh, catching up with the saints. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, in a, in a small sense, it's a, a picture of one day you're going to lie, lie down permanently in death until God calls for you to come back to life again. You're picturing that in a small way every time, every night you go to bed. I mean, I work for a funeral home. Uh, we, we try to display people after they die so that they look comfortable, their head's on a pillow, they look like they're just sleeping. When someone says, oh, she looks like she's just sleeping, that's a great compliment to the staff in the mortuary. When you sleep, it's with the expectation that you're going to get up again, right? Every night. And so when you and I get baptized in water, that doesn't wash away your sins. It's a testimony that my sins have been washed away by faith, and the new part of me wants to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. Something old in me has been dead and buried, and I'm sort of symbolizing it by water, and something new in me is now alive to live after the Lord Jesus. All of that imagery, all of that picture and figure is being presented when you put your head on your pillow, when you get baptized in water. And what the Mormons did is they took the little word for and they pushed it in the back, backwards, for their ancestors that had died, when they should have pushed it forward where it belongs in anticipation of a future resurrection. When we get baptized in water, we're not getting baptized on behalf of our dead ancestors. We're getting baptized in anticipation of our own resurrection one day. So the, the Pentecostals uh, took the little word for and they pushed it in the wrong direction. And likewise, the Mormons took that little word for and they pushed it in the wrong direction. Remember I said the word for can go two, to wet, two ways. So two different groups took the same three-letter word and interpreted that word wrongly and created an entirely false doctrine. When it comes to the Pentecostals, think of the uh, Agnes Osmond in, the, in the, Topeka, Kansas and the, the Azusa Street Mission back in 1901, the early 1900s in Los Angeles, and whole denominations of Christianity have started based upon a, a poor reading of one or two verses in the book of Acts. An entire denomination, or entire denominations, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Foursquare denomination, uh, and then those churches end up having their splits, and then you have another group, a uh, similar group, that starts somewhere else over here. And from those groups came the snake handlers down in the hills of Kentucky somewhere, and, and then from them sprang the whole modern charismatic movement, the Benny Hens and the Oral Roberts and um, all of these other... Oral Roberts' entire career was based upon a false reading of Acts chapter 2. But see, this is why I've always been disappointed that I've met a lot of great Pentecostal friends, people I've known and worked with. My dad would say the same thing, who I know are saved. They believe in salvation by trusting Christ the same way we do. But unfortunately, their church and they themselves have never been taught how to believe the word of God and, and pay attention to every single word and learn the word of God carefully. They just rush through and say, well, it says... Uh, for the remission of that must be in anticipation. No, it means in light of past remissions. They just charge on through and invent an entire doctrine, and that becomes an entire denomination. You've got millions of people who have grown up in churches that were founded for no better reason than their founders uh, didn't read the English Bible correctly. They couldn't read, or they had difficulty reading properly, reading correctly. So little things do mean a lot. The word for, the word in, I-N, or the word the, 
or with, W-I-T-H, with tongues, not in tongues, for the remission of sins. A comma can mean a lot. Punctuation marks mean a lot. In one account, uh, in the book of, I think, First Chronicles, it recounts uh, Elhanan, who slew Goliath the Gittite, whose staff was, a, as a, the, it was like a weaver's beam. And uh, another text says Goliath, or, or uh, Elhanan, slew the brother of Goliath. And so one says he slew Goliath, the other says he slew the brother of Goliath. So when the King James translators came to this text, they realized these things don't match. Everybody knows David slew Goliath. So they added the three words, the brother of, into the verse, and they put them in italics so that the two verses would match each other. You go to all these modern English Bibles, and they take the italics out. So now it reads, El Hanan slew Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was as a weaver's beam, and so forth. They create contradictions in the modern translations. The King James translators were trying to uh, clear up contradictions, but the modern translators have actually gone so far as to create contradictions. Little things do mean a lot. And um, if, as a Bible believer, I don't believe it's my job to change a single word in the Bible. And uh, I believe in accepting even the italicized words because those are the words God saw fit to be printed in his book. And so I'll just consider those to be part of the words of God too. Do you realize when you do translate from one language to another, you do have to make adjustments so that the, the translated sentence reads just as smoothly as the original sentence does. Whether it's Spanish to English or Korean to English or English to Korean, uh, you have to make little modifications and adjustments. In, in uh, Spanish, you, instead of the White House, you'd say La Casa Blanca, the house white. But it doesn't sound smooth in English, so you reverse the, the syntax, so now it says the White House. Well, that doesn't match the original, and yet they both mean the same thing, but you do make little adjustments. And so if our Bible has some italicized words there by the hand of the providence of God, then I don't even believe in changing a word. I don't believe in changing a, a single punctuation mark in the Bible. Accept it as it is, because there may be something to it just like that comma we examined early on.